So, um, good uh, evening, Australia. Good uh, afternoon or noon, even, um, or morning in, in Europe. Uh, it's a pleasure to be and to host you here in the fifth seminar uh, of the Tigre project on trust and regulation. And uh, today is um, it, our guest is Valerie Bracewit uh, from the ANU. She will speak about contestable trust and democratic uh, governance, a paper that she prepared uh, especially for this uh, meeting. Val Valerie Bracewit, Val for our friends, is an interdisciplinary scholar. She's a professor of regulatory study, studies in the Regnet School of Regulation and Global Governance at the Australian National University, a place that I recommend to visit and to, to be. I was there, lucky to be there uh, years ago. Um, she has a background in psychology, a work focus on the inter interplay between regulators and regulatee, the governing and the governed, asking questions like what kind of institutional practices generate uh, defiance and disrespect, what role does social uh, capital play in regulatory effectiveness, and of course regulatory failure, and how should regula regulators manage the ebb and flow of trust and op among, and op among those um, uh, they regulate. I will stop here as uh, there is uh, more to read, but I think we are all ready to hear you, uh, Val. And thank you again for uh, being with us and the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you for the invitation and the introduction. Uh, I have four ambitions for this lecture. First, I want to open a dialogue about trustworthiness as care for others and of trust as the expectation that others will care for you. Second, I want to build a theoretical and empirical bridge between trust in the people who are close to us and trust in impersonal institutions, in particular, trust in regulatory regimes and trust in government. And third, I want to argue that governments and regulatory institutions need to be far more adept at picking up on when they should be using different trust building strategies for different institutional contexts and for different groups of people. And finally, I want to discuss what we might call the trust risk. By that, I mean gifting trust undeservingly, leaving ourselves or others open to exploitation through privileging trust. Now, there is a written paper that I'm happy to share. I don't have overheads, um, but uh, anything that you want to know about the talk, you can chase up later. Um, on the internet. First of all, why is trust so precious psychologically as well as socially? As social beings, we tend to live in communities, but we do so with some discernment. We look for a place that offers security and peace. If this is not on offer in a community, fear would likely keep us away at a safe distance from threat and from harm. Now, this is a situation we face with, COVID, with the COVID pandemic. Many of us have considered or currently consider our communities unsafe and retreat to the places where we can escape contact with the virus. Those who have homes stay in their homes as the virus spreads. Squashing that fear of COVID and venturing outside for essentials requires courage and hopefully a bit of strategic nous to keep safe. But we may also quell our fear with trust in others to protect us. Now, whether that trust is justified or not, or not is something that we'll address later. Ideally, our governance arrangements work well enough that we can trust that it's safe to go out if we take the precautions that authorities recommend. There'll be no virus that will latch on to us. There'll be no exposure to fellow citizens who are breaking quarantine rules or social distancing rules or rules about wearing masks. 
There'll be no fights in supermarkets over the limited supplies of toilet paper that might threaten us with physical injury, if not COVID itself. We trust other people to do the right thing and we trust government authorities, the traditional media and social media to be conscientiously monitoring safety and providing us with truthful accounts of what is going on beyond our homes. Now in these circumstances, and yes, they are ideal circumstances I'm describing, but I'm going to claim that we expect those who govern us to have these goals. So those, in these circumstances, my point is that trust is enabling. And that's why trust is precious. It replaces fear with assurance about what, can, what we can do in our world. We can put these parcels of concerns to one side. Others are looking after those parcels of concerns. We don't have to worry about it. And we can focus on what we want to achieve. It frees our mind to think about other things and enjoy our lives more fully. Trust therefore facilitates hopes. It enables us to get on with the things that we consider productive and meaningful, to bring others in to work with us, and that creates a sense of well-being. In short, it improves our mental health. This argument spots, spotlights the psychological benefits of trust that sit within that broader and more familiar argument that societies flourish with trust because trust reduces transaction costs. Now in making this psychologically focused argument for the benefits of trust, I'm juxtaposing trust against fear. Fear is crippling. We are constantly alert to danger. Fear limits our hopes and well-being. Fear makes us anxious and suspicious and more than likely dominating and oppressive of others because we cannot trust others to do the right thing by us. COVID has heightened our awareness of how fear and despair can replace trust and hope on a grand scale. COVID also has given us time to pause and reflect, to come to terms with how quickly institutions of governance can embrace domination and oppression when fear abounds. Now at this point, let me spell out my definition of trust. Trust is an attitude we have to other people or groups or organizations or institutions. As an attitude, trust is a composite of various beliefs. For example, this charitable organization is very reliable. This charitable organization reports openly on its governance arrangements. And then there are feelings that are involved in too, too about this organization that is part of this composite. I feel relieved that this charitable organization is doing that job, or I like the projects they support. The second element of the definition is that trust is relational. When we scan the world in which we operate, we see potential sources of harm and help. We confront entities that steer us or regulate us. We see entities about which we are curious, curious and others that don't interest us at all. Those entities that matter to us are appraised and monitored by us. When that appraisal is positive, and we expect that entity to reciprocate our positive appraisal by doing us no harm or better still, acting out of care for us, we have a trusting relationship. A relationship of care is an important part of my definition of trust. To trust a person or an institution is to anticipate that a person or institution cares what happens to me or all people in a situation like me, or people I care about. To be trustworthy or to earn the trust of another, we have to do our best to care for others, particularly when circumstances make it difficult to action our caring intent. Now using the word care in my def definition of trust might surprise some of you. Before 
supporting my argument empirically. Let me say that more familiar regulation and governance terms like human rights and procedural justice arguably have meaning and provide comfort to people on the ground because when practiced, they communicate a message of care. So where is my evidence for claiming care as part of my definition of trust? For a number of years now, I've done surveys in which I've asked people, what's needed for you to trust this organization or this institution? I have done this on more than one occasion with government, a complex and sometimes distant entity in the lives of Australians. Yet Australians have no difficulty in telling me what's necessary for a government to be trustworthy. Believing and feeling that their government cares about them is central in their responses. Just as important is the fact that there's a high level of agreement on what government needs to do in order to earn trust. Because of that high agreement, we call these actions trust norms, meaning the community agrees that this is what is needed to earn our trust. The strongest trust norms that people expect government to know and action are treating clients and citizens with respect, what I call a care norm, having interest in the well-being of ordinary Australians, again, a care norm, understanding the position of clients and citizens, a care norm, being accountable for actions, being efficient in operations, being consistent in decision-making, all three of which reflect competence and doing the job well with which we're very familiar in the regulation and governance literature. And finally, keeping citizens and clients informed and honesty and openness norm. Now these trust norms, what we want government to do in order to be trustworthy, are consistent with what the literature identifies as components of trust in leaders of organizations and workplaces being competent and reliable, managing expectations, establishing relationships of respect and concern, and being honest, open, and accountable. One of our completing PhD students, Therese Pears Lanella, identified similar dimensions as being critical in the work of electoral management bodies that provide expertise and oversight to ensure fair and peaceful elections in transitional democracies around the world. Therese's work is exceptionally useful in showing the dynamic nature of trust and the importance of being in touch with what's happening on the ground and responsive to doubts and suspicions. Trust is built through many small acts of understanding, realigning expectations and fixing problems. Building trust is about actioning a range of trust norms every time a failure is detected in the system. Central to my argument is that the contours of trust in person-to-person -person encounters are the same as the contours of trust in person-to-organization or person-to-institutional contexts. What I want to do is soften the sharp edges that have been set up between personal trust and impersonal trust. So let's do that by starting with the hard question. How can I say to you that I trust my favorite news source, traditional media or social media, because it cares about being fair-minded, it gives me truthful news, and it does so competently? In order to do that, you might say, I need data, and preferably data from a variety of sources if I am to have well-founded trust. Putnam recognises the difference in richness of data we have access to when he distinguishes between thin and thick trust. Putnam uses thick trust to describe 
personal relationships where we have a lot of reliable and valid data about those close to us. And thin trust to describe impersonal relationships or distant intermittent relationships with institutions and authorities where our data is scarce and fragmented and possibly less direct. At best, we may resort to following the views of others with whom we are connected and whom we trust to guide our evaluations. We might find ourselves using what John Schultz and others refer to as a trust heuristic, rather than painstakingly collecting and reviewing data. But this should not lead us to the false conclusion that the composite attitude of trust we have in a social institution is necessarily weaker or more malleable than the composite attitude of trust we have in our best friend. The richness of data to which we have access may differ, but the passion with which we hold our attitude of trust need not. The key to explaining this assertion is that trust is not just about beliefs, or what we know and believe to be true. It's also about feelings. Both beliefs and feelings constitute our attitude of trust. We may assert our trust in our favorite news source just as passionately as we assert our trust in our best friend, even if our database is thinner. What can give our news source a trust advantage, as it were, is that it may be far more important in making us feel like we belong to a vibrant, powerful community of like-minded people. A feeling of belonging is precious for us psychologically. Positive feelings, particularly when shared with others like us, lead us to believe this new source is honest and open, respects our views, is competent and does its job well. Our favorite news source, in other words, takes on the persona of a well-trusted friend. In short, good feelings translate into positive atti attitudes of trust about this news source with sets of beliefs that it's, it's believable, it cares about us, it does the job that we need a good friend to do. To lose that trusted source would be as personally destructive as losing one's best friend. The argument I'm making is that people close to us and the institutions that are far away from us can both be psychologically important to who we are and what we can do. In order to make sense of the world and feel safe within it, we mentally bridge gaps to satisfy our needs. Friends, authorities and governments can all provide what Tori McGeer calls a social scaffolding for realizing our hopes for ourselves and for our society. All can give us that sense of, our, of efficacy. They give us ideas, inform us of pathways, connect us with like-minded people and share our ambitions and dreams. In other words, impersonal institutions do as much to shape our identity and help us define what is meaningful and important to us as our closest friends. Once they become part of our social scaffolding, they earn a place in our trust bank, regardless of whether they're flesh and bone or an abstract construction that exists in our minds. The nature of this mental construction becomes even more elaborate when the institution's power threatens our lives. We ascribe to the authorities that govern us attributes and motivations, some database, some not. Included in these attributes is trustworthiness. It follows in this process that some organizations and institutions will fail the test. They will be seen as not caring, not competent, not open and honest and not interested in us. In other words, they'll be seen as not trustworthy. I've emphasized the dynamic nature of trust 
the idea that different parts of that trust composite can go off the rails and need to be restored. My message has been, we have to work at being trustworthy because we can't take trust for granted. But that's only partly true. There's also an argument that for thinking of trust as our default position in communities. A very important finding on the transference of trust from one-on-one -on -one intimate relationships to broad social groupings like government comes from the work of Jenny Job. Jenny found support for a model that showed trust rippling out from families to community organizations to local government and eventually to the tax office of the national government, not exactly an institution known for radiating the love. But what was so interesting about Jenny's work, in which she was ably assisted by the late Monica Reinhardt, was that the structural equation model that fitted their data best, and let me quickly add, it was cross-sectional data, not longitudinal data, but the best fitting model posited a causal flow of trust from close associates to community to highly impersonal institutions. Importantly, this model was a better fitting model than the one that our good governance literature would opt for first. One that allowed trust to flow in the opposite direction from sound government institutions down to close relationships. Now, let me just be clear here. The top-down model that trust in institutions increased, trust locally acquired and expressed, did receive support in this data. But that was not as good a model as trust flowing out from families, like ripples flowing out when a, flowing out when a stone is dropped into the water. Now this finding is in keeping with Eric Erickson's theory of psychosocial development, in which we negotiate crises at different points in the lifespan. Infants first negotiate the crisis of trust versus mistrust. Will their primary caregiver be there to satisfy their needs and keep them safe? The key anxiety infants face is this, will anyone come? If children, you're not supposed to feel guilty now about the times you left your child crying in the cot. These kinds of occasions, are, uh, and the, the thing that Erickson talks about most, of course, is feeding. This is the critical thing. Will anyone come to feed the child? If children learn that they can rely on their primary carer to feed them and care for them, they learn to trust. If their primary caregiver does not respond to their needs, infants are developmentally and socially disadvantaged. They are mistrustful, suspicious and anxious, too afraid to venture into the world of hope and to learn how to trust others. Now, this does not mean, of course, that one's life trajectory on trust is set at 18 months. I'm not saying that, nor would Erickson say that. On the contrary, many things will happen throughout our lives that alter our, trust, our levels of trust in people, organisations and government. And this, after all, is what Jenny Job found. Her analysis showed how the ripples of trust could be blocked by experiences of untrustworthiness in the wider world. But Jenny's main finding of trust rippling out from families does have important implications for democratic governments wanting to lead prosperous societies. The policies they adopt to support parents, babies and families are investments in a future generation that has capacity to trust and hope and use social capital to their own and their society's advantage. And if I can tie that back to regulatory situations, I think in many parts of the world, child protection regulatory agencies do anything but support parents, babies and families to develop those trust relationships early on. I mentioned earlier that building trust means being responsive to breaches in trust norms. 
And it follows that we have to tailor trust building or trust restoration activity to the types of breaches that have occurred. In Australia, we might suppose that recent accusations of corrupt government deals over land development flag different trust norm breaches than illegally harassing welfare recipients to pay false debts to government that were generated through a defective algorithm and known to be a defective algorithm. My argument for why democratic governments should be more attentive to these breaches in trust norms is based on the premise that if a government abides by the norms, the gift of trust from the public will be the reward. There is a caveat here, however, and one which may be driving the actions of governments that appear to be moving in exactly the opposite direction than that which I am advocating here. I've been keen to point out in this lecture that trust is a valuable asset for us as individuals providing we are practiced in applying our trust norms and trust heuristics, and we have learned to trust well. In regulation and governance scholarship and practice, however, our greater concern is to set up institutional mechanisms so that there are basic protections against harm that includes abuses of trust. And so we can harness the collective to work cooperatively together when it is, it is in all our interests to do so. And COVID is a perfect example of our need to marshal collective action. For me, that's a regulatory exercise. Governments need our trust to lead change in public behavior. But as we know, many governments are facing defiance. Now, from what I've said so far, it'd be correct to expect me to say to authority that to say to authorities that they can build trust through acting in accordance with their trust norms. But what if we have a proportion of the population who reject the relevance of trust norms? And we do. We have 10 to 20 percent who say, they don't care if government abides by these trust norms or not. That won't affect their level of trust. Now, does that small percentage, and it's a relatively small percentage, does it matter? It turns out that it does, and it does matter very much. In my work on motivational posturing theory, I look at the signals that we send to regulatory authorities and to government about what they're doing to us and expecting of us. Motivational postures are more fine grained than trust and they're not deep seated um, uh, feelings and beliefs that we don't express to others. The idea of a posture is it, it's open, it's front stage. But I think it does reflect how we feel about and how we want to position ourselves in relation to authorities. We can move around authorities. We can be close to them. We can hide from them. And that's the motivational aspect to motivational posturing. Now we repeatedly find evidence of five postures in our regulatory work in Australia. We can signal commitment to our authorities like we know they're trying to do what is best for us. We can signal commitment, we can signal capitulation to our authorities. We're prepared to go along with the flow, no matter what, we'll do what you want. We can signal resistance. The authority is treating us poorly and unjustly. We can signal disengagement. The authorities are irrelevant, just ignore them. And we can signal game playing. Look for the loopholes, work around authorities, just do what you want. Now we're all well versed in using all of these postures and we draw on them to adapt and protect ourselves when we feel threatened and intruded upon. These postures emerged unexpectedly in an empirical study of nursing home regulation more than 30 years ago now, 
a study which was conducted with John Braithwaite, Tony Mackay, Diane Gibson and others. But since that time, the research challenge has been to replicate the findings, which we have done many times, and build theory around our empirical knowledge of these postures. And as it happens, that theory intersects strongly with the trust literature. Underpinning the postures, I theorize three cells or ethical identities, if you like, that need to be socially nurtured and understood by authorities. These cells define who we are and we're protective of them. When these cells are threatened, we move away from authority. When we're, they are emboldened, when we're shown tolerance for them, we may move closer. The first self is a moral self, and that's actioned or it's expressed as being a good person, a good member of society, law-abiding and responsible. The second self expects justice and respect and can be aggrieved, especially when democratic rights are abused. So I call it a democratic seeking self. The third is a self of ambition, status and accomplishment, a status seeking self. Now these three selves are in constant dialogue. We adapt to our world and its demands by balancing them. The best thing an authority can do, particularly a regulatory authority, is to ensure that all three are healthy and in play. If an authority fails to nurture moral obligation, or as Bruno Frey describes, crowds out our internal motivation to be a good citizen or a good person with oppressive actions, our democratic seeking self and our status seeking self are awakened and consume all of our attention. Is there injustice here for myself or others, we ask? Are my hopes and dreams being destroyed by this authority, we ask? And do others share my view? Because if others, sh others share my view, then the capacity to push, push back against this regulatory authority is pretty strong. A democratic seeking self that becomes aggrieved and a status seeking self that becomes frustrated pushes us toward defiance. Now defiance can be of two types. Resistant defiance occurs when an aggrieved democratic self crowds out a moral self. Dismissive defiance occurs when a status seeking self crowds out a moral self. Now to return to our trust story. Trust and breaches of trust play a central role in fueling and calming resistant defiance. If the trust can be restored and the relationship repaired, the moral self will kick in so that citizens do the right thing. And citizens are pleased that their democratic collective self that's expressed grievances and concerns about what's unfair has been addressed by the regulator or the authority. That's their purpose. They're not out to destroy the authority. They just want the authority to behave differently and be respectful um, of, of, of democratic principles and of the people that they're dealing with. However, when we are dealing with the dismissive, with dismissive defiance, trust is far less important. Those who display dismissive defiance see the world through different eyes to the majority. They belong to a minority, usually around 10 to 15 percent, who say that trust norms don't matter to them. They're more likely to exploit trust as a weakness than respect it as a social virtue. And what we have learned about those who express dismissive defiance against government and regulatory authorities is that they see their world as a stage upon which they must win and are very comfortable bending rules and law to make that happen. Dismissive defiance 
as opposed to resistant defiance, is linked with rule breaking and illegal conduct. Now I'm going to speculate at this point, and this is, this is my speculation, that the phenomenon of dismissive defiance is making its presence felt in the world more and more. And it's becoming more visible to governments, particularly democratic governments and to citizens. In response to what government sees as an absence of deference to their power as the government of the land, what they are going to be doing and, and add to that an attitude of not caring about the law or government's wishes. I'm sure this issue of, of not being law abiding is a, is a big part of the problem as well. Governments responded to this with rigid laws, non-contestable decision-making algorithms and tough enforcement. They're seeing this become increasingly popular uh, in our country and I'm sure in others. Now such measures deliver deterrence and coercion impersonally and inflexibly. There's some reason to believe that these measures will contain dismissive defiance, defiance by imposing heavy costs. And as long as you've got the legal loopholes and the capacity to defer and delay tied up, it may well be that these kinds of, of initiatives will be effective in ensuring some deference to the law and to, to the government. But there's a catch here, and that is that as that is happening, then you're doing great harm to the management of resistant defiance. Resistant defiance grows when trust norms are breached. And breaching trust norms seems to be exactly what regulatory authorities and governments do when they try these, like these, deter, these measures of, of heavy deterrence and serious crackdowns on, on what they regard as unacceptable and uh, um, uh, dismissive behavior of their authority. And so the issue of contestable trust arises. It's contestable at two levels. First of all, there's the level of what we do to restore trust in one context and how that differs from what we do in another. Regulators often talk about being consistent, but here is an example where consistency makes no sense at all. What you have to do in one case will be different from another. We cannot sensibly use rule books or prot protocols to decide what to do. We have to get into the nitty gritty of the situation and understand the context and un understand the particular ways in which we are violating trust norms in the eyes of the public. I think it does require at some level face-to-face -face negotiation winning back that regulatory credibility. But that's not the direction in which our regula regulatory institutions are going. The second level of trust contest contestation is how do, we, how do we decide to nurture trust and hope and at the same time deal with dismissive defiance? by adopting the rigorous investigative and enforcement processes that may be necessary to contain exploitation of that very trust that we're trying to build, exploitation that might adversely affect citizens or embarrass governments. Now, responsive regulation and restorative justice were designed to deal with just these kinds of, of complexities. Um, but then you would expect me to say that given my, my regulatory origins. So let me leave that for others to discuss and suggest a principle that I think we have lost sight of and that may provide us with some guidance. The benefits of trust, and we've known this for, this is the traditional trust literature, the benefits of trust are reaped only when knowledge is freely available, 
where knowledge comes from many sources so that different perspectives and data points can be compared and is shared among many who have opportunity and encouraged to share their notes, speak their views and disagree publicly. But governments and regulatory agencies rarely seem willing to support this kind of transparency and public accountability. Instead, they often seem more, content, more intent on confusing, obfuscating and silencing. They set themselves apart from people who know most about egregious harms. They brace for media exposés, and then they wait for the scandal to blow over. Problems that have been identified just don't get fixed. So while, while I have enormous sympathy for those grappling with the complexity of regulation and governance, and I must say that I thoroughly enjoy working with regulatory agencies, always have done and still do. Nevertheless, I maintain that the responsibility squarely lies in the court of regulators and politicians to take the first steps to dealing with trust deficits. Until they listen to the public and act in accordance with public expectations, all our experience should tell us to be wary of trusting them. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Val. Um, questions from the audience? Uh, comments, uh, please. Uh, I see one, and uh, I saw one in the in the air, but I missed it. So maybe others. David, can I ask you to um, to uh, look after hands and comments and yeah, stuff? Yeah, sure, 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 sure. So you can you, you can always. Um, um, you can always uh, write uh, in the chat box, but also you can also raise your hand. And I see Tali Gal, my uh, colleague from Haifa and the NU. Uh, I saw her more at the NU than in Haifa, but uh, here we are. Tali, please. We don't hear you. <laughs> Me first, wow, thank you. Uh, Val, it's great to see you again uh, and hear you again. Actually, uh, it's really a joy. And uh, of course, uh, what caught my ears more, more than no, anything okay. was, the, was the connection what? that you made between um, well, that's uh, okay. family trust, that's uh, trust okay. within the family, and uh, you know, the, the, the ability to trust others and in institutions. And what I'm thinking is that maybe you know, there is something like trust trait or being able to trust others, which is born, you know, in, in the family in the early years. Mm -hmm. So perhaps another thing that regulators can do and, and governments can do is actually invest in the families more. And then in the long run, you can see connection between taking care of families, raising more trustful people, and then the disengaging resistant people will be less resistant or maybe you know the, the numbers will drop from 15 to I don't know five because they'll be more trustful in the first place so I don't know yeah. that's a long-term plan no it's lovely to see you too Tally, Tally and that's and that's quite right and that that has been one of the arguments for saying that we differ so much um, in our in our trust levels um, uh, and and I think there's probably there is, if I remember correctly, I read some some evidence that just that suggests there's biological bases to 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 trust as well. Um, I think from a social perspective, though, uh, if you have a child that learns to trust early in a family that understands trust and does trust, then of course the child's going to be more adventurous, more exploratory. And one of the things about trust, no matter, I mean, we can't always, we, we all trust badly at some point in our lives, let's face it. But in a sense, it's like everything else. It's all about practice and, and learning. 
Um, and so if we can help families get off to a good start and get their children off to a good start there, then, then that's sound, it is sound policy. Um, uh, I have no evidence, and I should make this very clear, for linking up dismissive defiance um, to um, not being fed as a baby, to, <laughs> to, to, to put it uh, bluntly. And I don't, I don't believe that for a moment. I think it's far more complex. But I do, the point that I, I would emphasise there, and because both of us work in that child protection space, um, it is so important for governments to not complain about the money they're spending there, but to invest in, in helping families. Um, and, uh, and that's particularly acute now in this post-COVID era where so many of them are without jobs. They're doing terrible jobs. Um, they're, they're, the difficulty in parenting must be enormous for many of them at the moment. So, um, yeah. Great. Thank you, Van. Thank you. David, you're muted. Uh, sorry, Melanie first and then Tony. Thank you very much. Thank you. I kind of gathered that that's what you were saying. Uh, <laughs> and thank you. Uh, thank you, Valerie, also for a very interesting uh, talk. Um, really enjoyed it. Um, um, I just wanted to pick up on the point around dismissive defiance, uh, because that's um, quite, it's, it's just an interesting topic to think about, particularly when you're talking about kind of, I think you were saying about 10 to 15% of the population uh, that would uh, have that kind of attitude uh, and not value trust, uh, perhaps. So that kind of makes me wonder what can we do to re-engage uh, citizens? Um, you were referring to uh, procedural justice as well, which uh, uh, made me think that kind of outcome of decisions of governments and how decisions are being made are really important um, kind of elements to um engage citizens but would those strategies work for the that that percentage of the the population that you're talking about or mm. do we need a kind of mm. different framework that, to re-engage them yes that's that's right melanie it, it's the problem with those that are dismissively defiant from the government's perspective is that they're terrified <laughs> uh, and, and we see dismissive defiance being um, uh, I, mean, I mean in some areas if you if you take terrorism for instance of course there's no um, no one is going to condone it in that space but if you move to aggressive tax planning you will have that kind of behavior being condoned but um, uh, in either either situation, it's extremely challenging for governments. Um, and I, I think that what we see are governments reacting to control this instead of working out a strategy for dealing with it. Um, we know that um, having clear law, empowering the law, actually having um, prosecutions and, and, and acting um, uh, against illegal behavior, whether it be environmental um, crime or whatever, this, this can actually rein in, um, uh, not, not, all, not everyone, of course, but it's a signal, it's sending a signal that this is beyond acceptable behavior. So that's one thing that can be done. But the other thing, and I think this is particularly important in the context of aggressive tax planning, is to have a public discussion about what is acceptable and what is not. Now, my data come from surveys, and so you must all may always be thinking, or I certainly am always thinking, is this percentage higher than that 10 to 15%? But even if it is, and I think COVID showed us this in, in Australia where we had lockdowns, et cetera, most of the population were not dismissively defiant. They certainly were 
resistance, you know, they had the defiance of resistance in the sense that they complained constantly about what was, what was going on, but they did what they were asked to do. So these kinds of experiences, I think, give you a sense of what the norms are, and that's good feedback. So any mechanism that now allows us to talk about the norms I think can help with dismissive defiance. But then, of course, we have to be aware that there are subpopulations that we, we need to um, perhaps deal with separately. In other words, the aggressive tax planners probably don't care at all if I disapprove of what they're doing. <laughs> yeah. So it, it, it needs a different kind of approach. Um, yeah. But I, I think it, I, I don't see how we do it other than conversation. Um, uh, and I think that's what regulatory agencies are not doing enough of. Yeah, and trying to understand uh, the maybe informal structures to which they can be defined as well and, 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 in, and ensuring kind of an, uh, an environment in which uh, there are also, uh, there's also kind of social uh, norms or social informal accountability where um, compliance is enforced uh, mm. through networks perhaps. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Tony, please. Right. Okay. Um, thanks very much for that talk. I, I really enjoyed it. Found it fascinating. It reminded me of the book you edited with Margaret Levy um, quite yes. a few years ago now, which I it was yes for um, developing my own knowledge in this area. Um, a couple of points um, I think that I'd like to raise with you. Um, the first one was in relation to contestable trust and the need for a lack of consistency by regulators. Um, I entirely agree with that, but um, the problem is that it conflicts with a totally different vision of trust, which is trust as commitment. Um, you know, the, 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 the Levy and Spiller work from years ago and so on. The idea that a regulator develops trust through creating conditions for stability, through not changing, through not being responsive. Um, mm -hmm. And I think this other version of trust has become dominant, really, in, in the language of international investment treaties, but also in the work of many regulators. Mm -hmm. And I think that's an extraordinarily hard um, conflict to deal with. I'm doing work on um, contracting out public services at the moment. And I think this conflict is key. Mm -hmm. uh, second point, which is also related to this, is when you talked about the relationship between you and your news provider being similar to your relationship with, with your best friend in terms of trust, um, it struck me that there's a very important difference here. Um, your relationship with your best friend is not mediated through the market. Um, your relationship with your news provider is. Um, hence, the, the attitude of Facebook, etc., to mm -hmm. um, the, um, the, the, the spreading of fake news on the basis mm -hmm. that that's clearly a huge market advantage. Mm -hmm. um, similarly, in the UK, the very low quality of the popular press has been caused by jockeying um, for particular positions in the market. Um, the threats to the BBC are largely caused by market pressures from private providers. So I think there's a huge difference in those two relationships. Um, and this is something I think that you can spread also to other provision of public services. Um, for example, um, offender support in the UK was contracted out. It was an absolute disaster, largely because of extreme market pressure on mm. the companies that were chosen to provide the services. So I wondered if you'd be able to respond to those two points. Yeah, yeah. On the consistency, I totally agree with you that, that we are so far down this track of, of being consistent and regulators being quite frightened to adjust to circumstance. And I, this is a serious problem. I mean, my answer to it is that you're always accountable and integrity demands that you 
explain your actions and if they're different for person A or, you know, or organization A and organization B, you explain why and you stand strong and tall. That, that's kind of my view of that. But I, I totally um, uh, agree with you that uh, if you have someone doing that, they will probably lose their job in Australia because the government would be so cranky with them and there'd be so many complaints that you'd be just dismissed. But that doesn't change the fact that our capacity to regulate well and with integrity is greatly um, sacrificed by this uh, silly business really of doing the same thing for uh, treating people in or, or organizations in exactly the same way, being consistent in the way that we deal with a problem. Now, having said that, of course, if there are mandatory, um, uh, uh, you know, if the law says that X must happen, if this kind of breach occurs, well, of course, one, one does that. But that's really not, the, not what I'm concerned about. I'm concerned about the dialogue that goes, goes on. For instance, if it's a, let's say it's an educational regulator, if it's a small provider that's going bankrupt, then why not bring that small provider in and sit down and have a chat and try to work out a way of helping? You wouldn't do that with a, a major public university if they were doing, some, doing the very same thing because they have both the resources and the knowledge and the capacity to fix it up. You give them a phone call and say, get your act together. Um, so it's at that level where I think that, um, uh, and I don't see why that can't be explained to the public. I mean, I think that's something that's accountable. But of course, it's a, it's a continuum, isn't it? I mean, where can you deviate from this treat everyone the same way and get away with it? And when do you use, lose your, your job? So, um, yeah, it's, it's difficult. On the question of the markets into, you know, being the, a factor, I totally agree with you because what it... What it's doing, that market, is distorting the information that you have. Um, I'm not, I, I can't have access to the information I need, whereas I can have access to the information that I need to judge the, you know, my best friend's uh, trustworthiness. Um, so in a way, that's why I ended with that principle of information, which is such an old one um, that, you know, that was very big when Margaret and I were doing the book too, that you need data, you need information. Um, that's absolutely critical. And we've made so little progress in, in, in making that available through government. I mean, thank heavens, we've got Wikilinks. Um, uh, I think the whole regulatory capitalism um, uh, change has actually meant that, that we can get uh, information often illicitly, but government itself has not taken that step of sharing information more broadly and certainly has insisted that market players and those uh, who, who, who are filling, fulfilling contracts with the government um, make their data know. I, I mean, the commercial in confidence stuff um, is such nonsense in so many cases that it is used to stop that information from getting out. So yes, I agree with you on that. But from the point of view of the person who's sitting there deciding who to trust and who not, who doesn't, who they shouldn't trust, they don't seem that aware of that issue. And perhaps again, that's public education, talking about these things, being open and not and just not falling into the trap of thinking the market solves everything and outsourcing is has no faults at all, which is a bit the way we are in Australia, I think. Thank you. Thank you. Um, anyone else um, wants to, to come in? Um, there are a few um, comments in the chat, starting with uh, Mark, Marcus, uh, who suggested, do you think that um, citizen juries uh, are, is a good method for improving trust, trust between uh, citizen and government. Mm -hmm. And I can yes. add, um, I can add, um, 
do we need the Ministry of uh, Trust or Agency for Trust, like uh, ministries of uh, of uh, happiness or maybe yes. hope? Uh, yes, that's right. Yeah. That's right. I definitely, I, I think civic engagement, all those mechanisms of civic engagement are really important. And um, uh, Carolyn uh, uh, Hendricks here in, in Australia is doing a lot of work on the way in which communities have really, um, especially some of our rural communities have just decided that they'll organize themselves. Thank you very much. We, you know, we have droughts and bushfires and heavens knows um, what sort of problems in, the, in our rural regions. I mean, the quality um, of services is very poor. So we're seeing uh, uh, lots of communities trying to get independent um, members of parliament in, in and uh, are organizing themselves. So that, that whole civic engagement movement, which I know is happening elsewhere in the world, is a really interesting place to, to look at the, the strengthening of horizontal trust and then the question to ask, is that going to wake governments and regulators up to see that they really need to get their hands dirty, get into those communities and not, I mean, get their hands very clean perhaps, um, uh, but engage, engage in, in what's happening directly. So yes, yeah, I'm very for, much for citizen juries. And yeah, I mean, I, I, I think also David, uh, um, uh, quality of life measures are taking off in various parts of the world. I think New Zealand has one and, um, you know, that, that the government owns and, and uh, runs each year. And um, I think that's happening in Canberra as well. So that's another way in which we see movement towards, I think, being um, more person focused or more human focused. Hey, thank you very much. Uh, anyone else that uh, want to come in? Uh, uh, you know, last one. Um, uh, if if not, um, I will let uh, Valerie and the Australian uh, guys and uh, here um, go back to their own uh, private life. It's 10, 10 p.m. in Australia uh, now, and I would say uh, very thank you very much, Valerie. Uh, I appreciate the, 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 the lecture very, more, very much. Uh, looking forward to read the, the paper. It will be available on the website. And um, a lot of ideas, um, as uh, Frederica Six uh, wrote there in the chat, chat. So thank you very much again uh, to everyone. We meet next week um, uh, with Andrea Reneda uh, on trust in digital technologies. Um, program, program is on our website and I'm happy to see you here again next week. Thank you very much. Thank you, Val. Thank you. Thank you.